Hello, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Tal Lieberman, and I'm the security research team leader at Ensilo. And today we're going to be speaking about atom bombing. Now, when we released atom bombing back in, uh, back in October, we noticed it got a lot, of, um, a lot of media attention. However, not much of this media attention contained a lot of uh, implementation details. So it's nice to come here and present the in-depth implementation and how we did what we did. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to briefly review code injection, what code injection is. We're going to take atom bombing and break it into three main steps. The first one is going to be write what where, which is the ability to write whatever we want into wherever we want in the target process's address space. And then um, we're going to move on from there to execution, which is basically being able to execute code within the, within the context of our target process. And we're going to finish off by restoration, which is cleaning up our footprints and making sure we leave no incriminating evidence. And then we'll finish with some final words. So very quickly, what is code injection? Code injection is the process by which an attacker can get one process to manipulate another process to execute code on its behalf. Now, this is something that is used by attackers many times to bypass uh, common security solutions by injecting code into legitimate apps or into uh, whitelisted programs, et cetera. And um, also, it is used to access context-specific data, such as taking screenshots or decrypting passwords, um, such as passwords encrypted by Google Chrome. So what is atom bombing? Atom bombing is basically, it's, it's a new injection technique uh, that leverages the global atom table and APCs, which are async procedure calls. Now, when, when we released it back in uh, October, it went undetected by almost all security solutions that we tested it on. Um, and the interesting thing about atom bombing is it doesn't rely on any flaw or bug or security issue. It simply uses normal features of the OS to, um, to get the code injection working. And so there's no security hole to plug here. It's just features of the OS used legitimately. And so there's no patch that's going to be rolled out anytime soon because this is not something that is patchable. It's going to keep working just like other um, methods that have been used in the past. So in order to understand atom bombing, we first have to understand atoms. So what is an atom table? An atom table is really just a mapping of 16-bit integers to strings. So for example, I, as an app developer, can call the OS, pass a string to it, and ask the OS to store it for me. Then I get an atom back in return, and I can save the atom where I want. And whenever I want to get the string back again, I simply call the OS again, and I give it the atom that I received from the previous call. Then the OS will return the, um, the string to me. Now, there are two types of atom tables. There's the local atom tables and global atom tables. The local atom tables are not very interesting to us because they're accessible to a single process and are entirely managed in user mode. However, the global atom table, on the other hand, is accessible across processes, which makes it very interesting to us, and it's also managed by the kernel. The two functions we're going to look at that we're going to use to manipulate the global atom table are global add atom and global get atom name. Global add atom is a simple function that gets a string as a parameter. And, um, and returns an atom. Now that atom is the 16-bit integer that is used to, um, to rep basically represent the string in the atom table. It's sort of like an index. The second, the second um, function we're going to look at is global get atom name, which is basically the inverse function of global add atom. And this function uh, receives an atom, a pointer to a buffer, and the size. Now the size is just there to avoid any buffer overruns. But um, what this call does is it gives me back my string. And it'll write it to wherever I want, because I can control the pointer being passed as a second parameter. Now, in theory, if I could somehow call global add atom, store some code in the global atom table, and then I could somehow call global get atom name, and I could somehow control all the parameters, that would get me my write what where. The ability to write whatever I want, wherever I want, within the address space of the target process. So let's try to clear up how this can be done. 
What we're going to try to do is we're going to use uh, a mechanism called APCs, which is async procedure calls. Now, malware has used this, uh, this mechanism in the past, but um, not in the same way that, uh, that we're going to use it. So basically, we have, um, if we take a look, we have a function called QUSERAPC. Now, this function is pretty simply um, gets a handle to a thread, a pointer to a function, and a parameter to run as the parameter for that function. And the only problem with this is that the function is of the, of the prototype that we see over here in the middle. Now, um, what we want to run is the function here on the right, which expects three parameters. So this obviously is not going to work for us because we can't control the other two parameters. So we're not giving up yet. We're going to take a look at the implementation of QUSER APC. And as you can see, uh, under the hood, QUSER APC actually uses the undocumented system call uh, NTQ APC thread, which instead of passing a pointer to the function that I want to pass, it'll pass a pointer to RTL dispatch APC, which is actually a, um, a wrapper function that'll execute my function after. Now, the only interesting detail here is that RTL dispatch APC, which is available in all Windows processes because it's part of NTDLL, it has the same exact prototype as global get atom name, which is simply to pass three parameters standardly on the stack. Now, what we can do is we can simply cut the middleman and call the, um, call the system call directly, passing it a pointer to global get atom name instead of passing it RTL dispatch APC, and that way we could just control all three parameters. So problem solved, now we can write what where, because obviously we can call global add atom and store whatever we want in the global atom table, and now we've seen that we can force the target process to, using APCs we can force it to retrieve the data that I've stored in the global atom table. So moving on to step number two, now that I can write whatever I want in the target process, I can obviously only write to places that are writable. Now for code to execute, it needs to be executable. And obviously, I can never be fortunate enough to find both executable and writable memory in the same place. So what we can assume to find is memory that's writable and write our code to it, and then use return-oriented programming to allocate um, executable memory, and then copy the memory from the read-write section to the executable section, and then run it. So uh, that's all nice, and we have here on the right, you can see the actual uh, ROP chain. Um, which you guys will have the slide so you can see it in more detail later, and we're gonna see a short demo to really demonstrate how this works. Um, so it's really nice that we have some ROP chaining, but how do we get the ROP chaining to start working? So we're gonna try to leverage another system call called NT set context thread. Now this system call receives a handle to a thread and a context structure. Now this, um, what, what it will do is it will actually just make the, take the context structure, which is a mapping of all the values of all the different registers, and just update the context of the thread being, uh, being passed. So what I can do, I can, what I can do is I can, um, I can simply change the instruction pointer and the stack pointer in the context structure. We don't want to use uh, this system call directly, though, because it's very suspicious. It's, it's known to be malicious, and if I'm controlling a single, uh, a single pro process, and my process is trying to change the context of a thread in a different process, that's something that any normal uh, security solution is supposed to flag very easily. So what we want to do is we'd actually like to have the target thread change its own context by calling, using APCs again to call, to have the thread call NT set context thread on itself. And we can pass the handle to the current thread and the pointer to, um, to a buffer that's been, um, that's been already initialized to point to our ROP chain. Now, the only problem here is that NT set context thread expects two parameters, not three. As we saw that before, uh, we need to pass either, either three or one, but we don't have an option of two. Fortunately for us, in this specific scenario, once execution gets passed onto the kernel, the code never returns to the same flow of the system call that, um, that changes the execution because the execution's flow gets diverted to run our shell code, to run our code. And so there's really no problem here. So let's take a look at this uh, ROP chain in action. I, uh, 
configured my debugger to stop immediately after the execution has been, uh, the execution flow has been diverted. So if we take a look at where the instruction pointer is and at the stack, we can see that um, the instruction pointer is currently pointing at NT allocate virtual memory, which is the function that's going to allocate, oh, okay, one second, sorry. Okay, so we can see that inst the instruction pointer is pointing at NT allocate virtual memory, and the stack shows that the return address is memcopy. So allocate virtual memory is gonna allocate some executable, mem executable memory for us, and then it's gonna jump to memcopy, which will copy the memory from the read-write section to the newly allocated executable memory. And the executable memory is actually gonna be stored right here, where we have zeros. So let the, let's let this run. And take a look at the stack again. And we can see that where we recently had zeros, now we have a pointer to an allocated buffer. If we take a look at the protection for this buffer, we can see that it's page execute read write, which is exactly what we specified. And if we take a look at what's in there, currently we have zeros. So we'll take one more step and we land right into memcopy, which is supposed to copy the memory from the read write section to this section. So if we take a look again at the stack, we can see that this is the destination address, which is our null, uh, null buffer. And this is the source address. If we take a look at what we have here, this is our shell code. This is the code that's gonna execute and gonna do some malicious stuff. So um, we're just gonna let this, uh, let this run. And if we take a look at this again, where we once had zeros, we now have data. If we try to disassemble it, we can see that that is our shell code, except now it's executable when it wasn't before. So, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a few more steps until we finally land in our shell code. So now our shell code is running. If we take a look at um, EIP, we can see that the shell code is what's executing now. And we, we will let it run for a bit. This is a few calls to load library and to get proc address. And finally, it does something interesting, which is to call winexec, which is an API that'll spawn a new process. So let's zoom out and let this run and see what happens. And we see the calculator pop up. It means it works. Very nice. Okay, back to the slides. Thank you. Okay, so uh, what we did is we, we hijacked a thread. And we had that thread execute some code on our behalf, and that execution was to create a new process. Very nice. But that thread has a, had a purpose before we had hijacked it. And so we need to restore the thread's execution, because if we don't, there's no telling how we could affect the target process. Now, since, um, since the, we're now in, in the context of an APC dispatching, we know that somehow the OS needs to return execution safely because that's just how APCs work. And so if we take a look here, we can see that before dispatching the APC, we can see right here that the original context is backed up into a register named EDI. And in our specific scenario, once the APC is dispatched, this code never executes because we're diverting the execution to execute our shell code. But what actually happens is a call to ZW continue, which is a system call that continues the execution, basically moves the execution to the next APC call, finally resuming execution safely. So what, we do, what we we're gonna do is we need to take a look at EDI and pass it to ZW continue ourselves. So this is a, an outline of our shell code and we can see that at the top we back up the value of EDI into a temporary variable and at the end of the, um, at the end of the shell code, instead of just returning, which will cause a crash, we call ZW continue with the backed up value of EDI. And that is what, what'll make it um, return back safely. So if we take a look again back to the demo, we can see that the next thing that's gonna happen is a call to anti continue. And then if we take one more step, we can see that the debuggy is running 
And if we go back and we take a look at Google Chrome, which is the attacked process, we can see that it's pretty much intact and everything seems to work just fine. Okay, so to sum up, um, what we did is we, what we did is we, um, we broke atom bombing into three steps. Step one was write what where, and we achieved that by calling global add atom and uh, queuing an APC that calls global get atom name to write our code into a, uh, a read write section of memory in the target process. Then in order to gain execution, what we did is we used ROP chaining to allocate executable memory to copy the memory from the read write section to the read write execute section and then to finally execute our shell code. In order to invoke the ROP chaining, what we did is we used, uh, we got the, the thread to, using APCs, we got the thread to set its own context to execute our ROP chain. And in order to restore the execution safely once we're done, we basically just restore the original context from EDI in a temporary variable and then call ZW continue to restore execution. Um, as for Microsoft's response, they basically said they're not really interested in post-exploitation techniques, which is very nice. Um, but we all know that compromise is inevitable. And basically, once the attacker has control over our, your network, post-exploitation techniques become the best way to, to detect and to start the cleaning process. So we do need to deal with post-exploitation techniques. And what I would suggest for third-party vendors is to basically just hook KI user APC dispatcher and block calls to global get atom name and to NT set context thread, which nobody should be calling in the first place. So this is never gonna generate any false positives. And that's it guys. Hope you guys enjoyed. I, I, well, I have a question. Yes. Maybe I actually know the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you seen this in the wild? Yes, yes, actually. Um, about two months after we, we, a few months after we released atom bombing, we saw Drydex, which is a very, very famous um, financial Trojan of some sort using atom bombing. And also it's a funny story because Drydex actually has a Twitter account, which is Drydex Bot. You guys can see it online. And once um, IBM uh, wrote a big write up about this, um, about this malware using atom bombing. He wrote on Twitter, uh, where have you guys been? I've been using atom bombing for two months. So it was really funny. <laughs> Thank you.